The rut is the most boring effingest freaking time of the year a lot of times, okay? It is. We're sitting all day. It's freaking boring. You see some scrubs. You see some doe. You don't see no shooters. But you can hunt 20 days. You might get one day, maybe two, all freaking season of days like that. And they're the magical days of rut, and that's why I'm a freaking rut hunter. I was like, well, if I throw a mic on, then I can help others the way that these people have all helped me. Born in the heart of the Pennsylvania deer camp. With the help of experts, friends, and local legends, we bring you valuable knowledge and powerful stories for your hunting adventures. Welcome to the East Meets West Hunt Podcast with your host, Bo Martani. All right, we're live. Ryan Glitzky, welcome back. What's up, buddy? Yeah, it's. I'm glad to have Moose back on the podcast, man. It's 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 good, good to good to get to talk to you again. It's yeah, funny, we, we we talk we talk quite a bit. Um, yeah, and uh, but you haven't been on the show since um, for Seven Springs. Almost, yeah, since Seven Springs yeah. a couple years yeah. ago. A couple years ago, yeah. I yeah. didn't even realize that because you know you've been. Uh, an instructor at the scouting camp the last yeah. couple of years, but we don't, we don't do podcasts there typically because we're so busy with yeah. everything else. But yeah, um, yeah, man, how you been? Good, man. I'm getting ready here. I'm, I'm itching, man. I'm yeah. ready. Oh, I know. I know. We, uh, you and I were trading texts. So we're, we're recording this at the end of August. Uh, this will be coming out here in October, most likely, but the, you and I were texting back and forth. It was just like we had a cold front there toward yeah. the end of August, and you're getting bucks on your cameras. I'm getting them on mine, and we're just like, oh man, it's yeah. it's, it's starting. We're, we're just staying that August 20th, man. I'm telling you, there's something there with it. Uh, every year, get around that time frame, and then you throw the weather in them cooler 40 degree mornings we had here. Uh, man, I had multiple shooters show up. It's crazy. Yeah, and and as we were talking beforehand, like those. You know, I might not see some of those bucks again until closer to the middle of October or so yep. to start coming back into those spots. But I don't care. Like that's just I, that's what I want to see. I just want to see they're around, they're alive. Yes, exactly. And and that's exactly. the time that you know typically that I'm going to be hunting them anyways. So yep, yeah. And and we we uh, we align a lot on that side of things because you know typically for the most part rut hunting. Or yes. in and around the the rut yeah. time frame. Yep. And what what has made you kind of uh, be a rut hunter? Um, I think it was just my circumstances over the years. Um, you know, growing up and like right now, kind of, you know, where I work at, and for me to get to the mountains, um, for me to leave my work, get to the mountains, and get set up, you're talking over two hours. You know, I work till four o'clock. It does not happen in early season, so I stay local. Um, around work, I may hunt some private stuff like that. And typically where I work, the quality of white tails is just not there. Um, occasionally you're running something decent. And over the years, just, uh, you know, I've learned, um, even in those pre those areas like that, um, that first part of the season, a lot of those areas get pounded pretty heavy with pressure. Um, and whatever quality bucks are there get pushed out. And like I said, we, you always hear the October, October law, which I don't believe in. Um, but I do believe in a pressure wall and that's what I'll see. A lot of pressure goes in, moves in, bumps what good bucks are there. And that, what happens is I've learned over the years and like that area of lower quality, uh, animals bucks is I have to wait for the rut for them deer to come back in. If that makes sense, like they get pushed out early and until that last week, pushing into October 20s on, okay, the deer, they got pushed out on the private or whatever and areas they feel safe, the does get them in trouble. Eventually what I've seen in those areas is they move back in. And then I get my shot at something, a better quality animal. Um, but actually over the last couple of years, I've really trained just in the big woods and mountains over the last, you know, seven, eight years. And it's just a time thing now. You know, I've always loved to rut, and those are the reasons I hunted the rut, to get my opportunities to something bigger. But now, it's a time thing. I can't get to the mountains until I'm on vacation for a month. So, <laughs> over the years, I've developed a rut hunter, but I've just now, is just, that's my thing. Um, last week, you know, of October through the end of the season, you know, for our season archery, um, that's how I just become a rut hunter. And, and, you know, doing for, you know, however many years, 20 plus years, I've been, you know, focused on the rut. I've been hunting for 30 some, but probably, you know, 25 of that plus has been figuring out the rut and hunt specifically the rut, you know, and trying to, be, you know, you try to master, you never do, but that's kind of what my game revolves around now is that pre-rut, rut phase. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's, I think it's such a good, 
idea for people, you know, especially if they're not, if they don't have the whole season off to go hunt, like yeah. find what you want, what you like and focus on that. Like it's, it's easier to, it's not easy, but it's easier to focus on a time of year so when you're scouting, you know what you're scouting for. You know, when, yeah. when you and I scout together, we scout very similarly. Cause that's how I grew up was always hunting the rut, the yeah. pre rut. That's when I took time off of work and was doing that. And, and it makes, it makes everything a little bit more focused. Yeah, I tell guys, like, if you bounce around, like, you know, there's bed hunters, there's rut hunters, there's food plot hunters, there's guys that sit in shooting houses and bl- ground blinds, whatever. Focus on something that you're good at, and you get, and you, you, I, you, like I say, you don't technically master anything with this game. You know, they humble us, the white tails, but you figure something out and you get good with it. You, you know, you master that one specific thing. Say, us guys, a rut guy. But then I'll start to branch off to be a bed hunter or early season hunter. But I think you got to focus on something particular, what works for you and works for your area and you can have the time with. Figure that out over a while. Get good at that and then start branching your way out. Because I think if you start bouncing around, you know, bed hunting is a whole different game than what we do. Um, If you start bouncing back and forth and you're not really good at either one, you're going to be frustrated. Um, (laughs) Master something, then move on to the next, uh, you know, test, you know. Yeah, no, and 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 it's it's funny you say that. Like as someone that again grew up just just basically hunting the rut for the most part, yeah. and I'd killed a few deer early, but it was just by happenstance, really. Same here. And then, yeah. and I tried getting into the bed game, and like I just I I struggle with finding specific beds yeah. that that I yep. can hunt and and go through that. And so I've kind of like transitioned even my earlier season stuff almost in a rut mind frame as far as yes. like scrapes and and trying to find you know i i think paul putera said it on my podcast here recently really good about is like kind of working your way back to where everything connects and that's usually yep. like a scrape that's yeah that's there and then just needing the right conditions for those deer to to hit that yeah. in daylight because we talked about this before me and you at the camp stuff like yeah is i don't i find specific buck beds but they, they seem to be like in a general bedding area, though. The buck beds here today, buck beds there. You know, it, it just seems so random at times. And I'd rather focus on, like I said, my game is security cover, bedding cover. Now, I focus on that as a whole, even through my rut. Security cover is king, the bedding area in general. But like that early season game, how I do it is, you know, I'm hunting the bedding area, not the bed itself. And I tell guys, like, uh, that bed hunter, if you got to scale 1 to 10, that bed hunter is like number one, number two on that buck. Like he's on that scale. Like I'm back like three, four. I'm just off of that bedding area, like focus on the, the first white oak or focusing on the first grape. Or instead of working off that one point, I may try to get two of those points coming out of that bedding area and catch them at the bottom of that, like, like a funnel or a ditch crossing. Like my mindset's still the rut even early season using terrain and habitat diversity to still kill them, if that makes sense. You yeah. know, I'm not right up over their bed. I tend to come back three, four. I think the biggest thing with me early season, I'd probably be more successful. I just don't put the time in the area with the big bucks, you know. But yeah. I kind of that's my game. If I had time, that would be my game because I'd probably get frustrated in the big woods, just me personally, mountains, hunting one particular buck bed. I can just see me getting frustrated from what what I've seen in my personal experience of what they tend to do. Yeah, like I'll, I'll give an example. There's a spot late season, which I believe late season is very similar to early season, other than their bedding is is – there's less spots they can bet at because you know there's not as much leaves on the trees and their areas are a little bit tighter. But there was a, there was a buck that I I thought I was pretty close to to getting a shot at, and I found where he was betting at or one of his betting spots um, after the season went. And I looked at it. It was funny. It was like, and I walked out every trail from that bed, you know, going yep. out, and I was like there's five different directions that he can go to and good scrapes on every corner of it. And it's like, really, it's, it's kind of hunting it like you would the rut where I need to basically hunt one of those spots for three, four days in a row and, and waiting for him to hit that cycle where he's going that direction. Cause he'll do it eventually. It's just like, when is it, when is it going to happen? Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yep. that's that's uh that's a frustrating part of the the early season time frame. But I mean, honestly, like I feel like us, you know, I'll, I'll throw myself in that category of rut hunter. We we get kind of shit talked a little bit as far as like, <laughs> oh, there's no skill. You just want to be lucky. Yeah, but. no skill. Yeah, th- yeah. I I hear that. Uh, I do hear <laughs> that at times. I laugh about it. Um, yeah. You know, we put in a lot of miles, a lot of hours, and yes, I think what people don't realize is. 
Yeah, the rut. You know what? I You look at the record books. Best time to kill whitetail is the rut. Absolutely, because they're moving more. But I think that's where patience really separates a lot of guys. You've got to be willing to be in the right spot for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight days in a row. Let me tell you, you sit one spot you have confidence in. You know it. There's multiple shooters in the area or whatever. Day four or five hunting dark to dark, let me tell you, man. <laughs> It'll turn men into boys real quick. <laughs> yeah. Like, so, you you and, need to mind a run, steal. It is easier hunting because you're going to see more deer. Bucks are going to be more active. But the physical, mental part of it, the grind, is what is, makes the rut hard. You know, um, because sometimes we get lucky, you get that October cold front, the last week of October, and the October 20s there, man, you're in the right area, it can happen, boom, quick, you're done. Our days, like we were talking off air here, you know, we're hoping for an early fall, some cool weather, finally this hunting season. You get the cool weather, it's typically a little easier to rut. We get hot weather, man, sitting in a tree when it's 70-some freaking degrees all day for days on out is brutal. That yeah. is not easy. <laughs> No, it's like because of the rut, you build up all the, you're you're building up yeah. to this this big show, yeah. you know, and it's like yes, then you get it and you get bad weather or just maybe it's not happening in your yeah. area at that time, and it yeah. just throws you. I mean, you got to really have a strong mind, yeah, at, yeah, uh, it, it, to get through I, it. It helps you, like we've been doing for a long time. It helps because we've seen the highs and lows of it. I think what keeps me in a tree for days on end and dark to dark is. I've seen the shooter at 1130 or 130, you know, middle of the day. I've killed deer back here on my wall when it's 75 degrees in the rut. You know, things like that keep me in the tree, even on the bad days. And I think that just takes experience during the rut to, you know, to mentally wise stay in it. Yeah, I'll, n I'll never forget a, a story. It was 2015, and I was hunting this creek bottom in this spot. on the, There was a funnel on top of this beaver dam, and I was sitting there for like, five days. Well, a good buddy of mine, uh, we didn't know this earlier on, but we were both hunting the same, basically the same spot. Our setups were 80 yards apart, but he was like on this ridge. I was on this ridge and all of a sudden yeah. led us into this one spot. And yeah. so we'd, we'd text back and forth about once we realized we were crossing over, you know, who was going to be hunting or whatever. And, and, and I said, you know, I said, Andy, I said, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not hunting today. I'm I'm putting my vacation. I'm holding it in. I'm going back to work. It's 75 degrees. It's November yeah. 4th. Like I went in. I remember being at work and he texted texted me at two o'clock in the afternoon. He said it was in his t-shirt and he shot a 162 inch deer at that crossing. And I went yep. to help him, obviously, and get it out. But it was just like that was like a real eye yeah. opener for me of like anything can happen. Yeah. Well, you look, what was it? Uh 2022 was a bitch. 2022. Yeah. Um, I remember you killed a buck. Was the fourth? It was the fourth. 4th. Yep. It was funny. That same day, I met, it was miserable. That was probably the worst season I've ever had. Um, it was like three weeks of just shit weather. And I remember you killed that buck on the fourth that evening. And that morning, I had my best opportunity at a big nine point that morning. And it was like, it just shows you, you just got to put that time in, you know? Yeah. And that was, that was it exactly. If you would have, you know, afterwards it's like, oh, it was a good season. But if you had asked me at two o'clock that day, it was yeah. not a good season. No, you know, I was struggling. I, I ate a tag that year. That season sucked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I went three and a half days without seeing a single deer, and oh, that was the first deer I saw. Tell me about. It. I remember sitting up there like the whole week. I saw like a total like five deer. You know, it was like, oh my god, it's brutal. And then you start moving too much. That I think that's a big, we'll probably get into it. I think that's the number one flaw with rut hunting is moving too much. And, you know, I'm trying to find the son of a bitch because I'm not seeing that. It's probably where I just buckled down in my best spot and just held out for the week. Something would eventually came through, you know. Yeah. What, what do you, how do you determine whether you're going to move or sit in a spot? Because you're like me and you have you have a ton of spots. You yes. have a lot of good yes. spots and yes. that, that can be almost a detriment to your mental game. <laughs> yes. Yes. What, what I'm starting to do, this is actually the last couple of years. Um, you know, we we me and you both have been around some fantastic white tail hunters. So you pick the brains of these guys and you bring that into your arsenal. Um, something I've changed over the last couple of years is, um, you know, okay. I have two or three dozen fantastic spots. Well, you know, you figure the rut itself, that last week of October, we get three weeks of November, it goes out. So you got, whatever, two dozen days. You know what I mean? Well, 
I got more spots than I have days to hunt, if that makes sense. So how I'm doing now is this is where my camper inventory um, comes into play. Um, the postseason, when you pull your cameras, what got left over? What should I have? Put your cameras out in the summer. I get my inventory pictures. End of summer, I pull them cameras. Okay, I know where my shooters are in general area. You know, if an area that I have two or three rut spots, say, in a particular area, if I have three or four shooters in that area, that's got my attention for the upcoming season, okay? Um, this is where the camera game comes into play, in my opinion. Um, what I do is take those two dozen spots, say, but maybe only a handful have the kind of bucks I'm after or multiple bucks that I want after. So those are going to be my focus, okay, is those spots there. And you're always going to have bucks, other bucks, and other spots, of course, on top of that. But I'm going to take, like, my five or six best of the best. These are my best opportunity because i'm an opportunist i'm just looking for a good buck i'm not really after one buck um so i've got five or six spots that got multiple shooters in when coming into late october into into november those that's where i want to be because my postseason scouting i got my intel with my summer you know velvet i know where i need to be now outside influences help somebody comes in they start a clear cut they start you know, that or you get hunt pressure that's where you always got to have those backups for those five or six. You know what I mean? But to sit there and go into 24 spots, we have it. it you're going to, that's why I said in 2022, I'm bouncing around a new area trying to figure out what's warm. Man, you're going to, you're going to pull your hair out. Even the weather's good. Yeah, they're going to be moving more and get lucky. But if you can buckle down to a handful, six spots, in my opinion, and rotate through them or, or however long, like I said, I almost have like what Steve Shirk says, that three day rule. I'm starting to apply that more and more. Um, unless I'm really blowing the area up with my access or my wind, I'm going to try to give it three days. Um, but I'll give it six days if I'm in it. You know, if I feel confident, I'm going to yeah. keep hunting. I'm just three days are up doesn't mean I'm going to leave. Um, I will leave after day one or two if an outside influence pressure another hunter or something. Yes, I will. That's where we maybe have to get out. You just have to read that situation with experience. But I think that three day rule is, is, really good to play off of during the rut and like i said you can have two muddy spots too so you have to figure out how to fine tune that down to a few spots come the prime time to where you're not chasing your tail also that's how i do it that's how i've been doing it. yeah no i no, i and i think having that kind of a, a system or putting some sort of rule in there helps you yeah. when you're not sure what to yeah. do it's like all right let me give it another day um because like the, the hard part about the rut and finding hot sign is usually when you find the hot sign during the rut, you're too late. And yeah, you ha you, yes, you have to take, like I said, this whole thing that I do is I take, you take your summer camera intel, mm -hmm. your postseason scouting, well, then you got to use some common sense in the in season reading the sign there, how you put all those three together to get you to a spot. You, you know, you kind of got to utilize all that. And like you said, a lot of times that sign Especially you started getting the first part of November, that sign was probably back in October 25th, 27th. They're laying down a lot of rubs, a lot of scrapes are heating up. You go in October 7th or November 7th, that might not mean him. He might be in the area still, it's hard to say. Or he could be shifting to a total different doe bedding area. Because that's the main focus. Guys got to realize what the main focus for me personally is the doe bedding. That's what's king in the rut. Yeah, and that's something that... I mean, it is so easy, you know, Johnny and I talked about this last year, you know, he was, he was so focused on early season, which he came really close to killing that yeah. last year. But he's like, man, I haven't been paying attention to the does. He's like, I know where these bucks are bedding, but that's not going to matter yeah. once the rut comes yep. in. Yep. Exactly. I, I th what I've learned over a couple of years is typically where you find your sign, the big scrapes, the big rubs, I can almost guarantee it. Um, it's probably in a round doe bedding area. I, I can almost guarantee it's going to be in around doe bed, and you're going to find a lot of good sign, a lot, especially scrapes. That's what I tend to find. My areas that six cents goes off, um, that's typically where I find a really great sign. It typically involves or connects some type of doe bedding, in my opinion, you know, which yeah. you work off of that, that's where you find your fantastic rut spots. You know, and, and, and one thing that last year kind of threw me for a loop a little bit. So, like, the end of October, I was hunting kind of around specific – doe bedding area a scrape that was on it and it was it was phenomenal i just ended up not yep. getting a shot at the buck i wanted but then that like after like november 3rd to the 6th in that time frame i was sitting these funnels in between places and i wasn't seeing 
you know, I was seeing small bucks, but I wasn't yeah. seeing those. Not seeing them short bucks. Yep. Those big ones cruising. And I, so I ended up just going directly to sitting downwind of a doe bedding area yeah. that I knew of. And that's where I had my opportunity at. And it was like, but it, that's that's also a hard thing that, that I kind of, I've been trying to really figure out like, okay, you know, with these spots, which ones are, should I, should I be sitting in these funnels that are kind of in between them? Or when do I you know, hover over these, this doe bedding waiting for one of them to come into heat that, that brings yeah. them into the yeah. area. It, it, yeah. And that's what's tough. I think what I've learned over the last few years, I've been really stri- trying, like I said, take those dozen, couple dozen spots, whatever, and pick my best of the best. And it seems my best of the best have all have one thing in common. And that is multiple doe bedding areas. And I'm situating myself in between multiple doe bedding areas. I am finding the terrain habitat diversity in between multiple doe doe bedding areas. Typically there, I'm seeing multiple shooters and getting opportunities. That's my best of the best. That is my A1. Those like right now sitting here today, I can name five or six of them off. They're on my list to hunt during the rut. Long as outside circumstances going, I have the bucks, of course, on, you know, the velvet picks. Those are my best of the best. Areas like that, the only thing that's going to screw me up is, A, we do get the weather. You, you know what I mean? That's just something. But that's where I'm just going to be lazy and stupid and not hunt those multiple days in a row. Yeah. Those spots, like, yeah, if you can find an area between multiple doe bedding areas, your access is clean. Man, you just got to put your time in there. You're going to kill probably something you're after. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I don't disagree with that at all. And, and like, the and, – and, like, when, when you can find – those multiple doe bedding areas and closer proximity, the better, you know, sometimes that's difficult with depending on how the deer density is and everything. But do you find, do you find any consistencies with the does as far as like things where they're bedding at or any like terrain or vegetation? Yeah. I mean, I think your type of briars, you know, raspberry, you know, all the, all the shit that pokes you. Yeah. <laughs> and on. Um, a lot off of points of ridges. Um, you know, I tend to find a lot of, a lot of doe bedding off the points of ridge, like where you think the classic buck bedding is. A lot of times I find there has to be, it's almost, you walk into it, the diversity, it changes. Um, the green briars, you just see that, that cover low, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Look out and it's just, yeah. you see that sea of green and stuff and patches of, and it's not like, you, like, it's not sometimes so thick. You can't walk like a clear cut. It seems to be that an area where they could visually still see and smell and everything, they'd probably see it coming. You know, if you understand what I'm saying, it's not like so thick you can't get through it. You know, like a big, or like a, a four, five, six year old clear cut. I'll see him on the edges of that, but me personally, it's like he's little micro. It's even hard to. It's like a, a little micro diversity area I'll find some of these some of these doe bedding areas, and there's just a little bit of diversity there. And there's some type of terrain involved also, if that makes sense. Yep. There's some type of terrain, a dr- top of a draw, a ditch. Then you have some type of diversity of habitat with green briars, maybe some blowdowns off of a ridge system. That's where I tend to find a lot of, I do find some buck beds in there, don't get me wrong, but those family groups of does seem to like to have a little bit of structure, a little bit of habitat diversity, and that's where I'm going to find them at. Yeah. And, and no, I was just, I mean, your example of when you look under the canopy and you see kind of green underneath yeah. it, whatever it is, like I just saw that yesterday I was in a spot that is somewhat new to me. And it's like, I really don't want to be going to new areas right now, but I'm trying to find uh, a certain deer. So I'm, yeah. I'm kind of branching out and I went in yeah. and I, I go in and all of a sudden, like everything was wide open, oak, cherry, maple ridge, yeah. you know, and I, saw you know people's cameras and stuff all over and i was like i gotta get away from this i went right to the edge where it dropped over off this bench going down towards the creek bottom and then all of a sudden i started seeing this wall of like four foot tall three and a half foot tall new growth where some of the yeah. trees some of the yep. trees had actually had died and it let the sunlight come through and stuff was coming yes. up and then i started finding some doe beds in there and then there was like a habitat edge where some pine hit that. And then I dropped over and there was this draw that was coming up with a couple like of fingers in that draw. And I went down there, I jumped a fawn and I looked and there was blowdowns in the steep part of the draw. And there was like four trail crossings that went like right above it. It's like, boom. I was like, I, I ended up throwing a camera up in the tree angle down at that, at that crossing. But I was like, man, this is a spot that I would hunt during the rut because there was doe bedding up on this point here where all that yeah. thick stuff was there was doe bedding on the side of this draw 
like, and this is a funnel that goes down in between yep. it, you know, like that to me is like a really yes. good I, spot. I, I said, we'll get off a little off subject here, but like postseason scouting is just as important to mark the dough betting is, as that big scrape, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. To me, you start dropping those pins. I tell guys, I'll do this with a scrape line, whatever you drop every scrape. No betting, you drop that. You can start to connect the dots with stuff. <clears throat> you start, you zoom out on your maps, and you know, you get to posting scouting, whatever app you use, and you start dropping those pins on your scrape line, stuff like that. You start dropping your dough betting areas. Man, you can connect the dots between all that and figure out where to be. If you zoom out on that stuff, you mark all that stuff, you can go home, zoom it out on a big macro picture, and, man, you can go back in your boots on the ground on a micro level, and you can pick out multiple kill trees in a location. Yeah. No, yeah. It, yep. Exactly what you just said, The the that secondary e-scouting, like, after you're done scouting. Yes. Like, I feel like a lot of times. Extremely important. People just look at, you know, they look at an area before they go in, mark points, they drop points, and they don't really yes. go back. But what you just said is the most valuable part of it. Like, my initial e-scouting is giving me locations to start and get in there and try to find things. And then once you're, after you're in there, then it's like, that's when I'm really peering over maps. Yes. This one spot I've been looking at, I was in there three different times in the spring and, you know, dropped a bunch of waypoints. And just the other day, I've, been, I've looked at this map like a bunch of times, but I, you know, I changed the orientation. I'm having it in 3d and I'm going around different. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I, I'm like, that's it. Like, I, I got to go check out that yeah. spot right yeah. there. And it was like, that looks like a pinch. It's kind of coming in between all this stuff. Well, you know, why, you know, why is that? And like, and, and, and I think that's so valuable. Exactly what you said right there. Yeah. You got to look at this. Like, I think sometimes we get out there, people scouting and they're looking so almost single-minded, just real, like what's here in a moment. Sometimes like we're in the big woods mountains, them deer are going to move a lot of times. They'll hold up. Like, you know, I've seen them even a rut. You know, they say bucks, you know, you catch that cruiser once every day. I'll see bucks move into an area and stick to an area, particular area for a while, you know, take care of those. But you got to look out in the big, the macro. Um, you may have a primary food source on a private property it's a mile away. And that doe bedding might be, you know, half a mile over here and another one half a mile over here. But you got to look out on that big area. It might be a mile or two, but you got to put that all together to where you start putting all those big pieces together, you kind of look on the map and say, there might be a creek system running through all that with a heavy crossing, you know, that you didn't really, you know, and it, it, it's connecting there. Maybe it's got points of ridges dropping down through this creek bottom where it's huntable with the wind and thermals and there's a heavy creek crossing, you know. A spot like that, you can hunt in a rut. Yeah, you're looking at travel that's a half mile away from a bedding area to a primary food source or a mile. But if you have multiple that around that kind of hub system, a travel hub system, Man, that is a dynamite location to kill a buck. A dynamite location. Yeah, cause you you hunt you hunt hub systems quite. Yeah, a bit, I don't, don't have you? a problem hunting low. Long as they're like you get, you know, we've all hunted Southern Ohio. We hear yeah. about Southern Ohio. That's pretty. If you've ever hunted Southern Ohio, that's pretty tight in the bottom. Oh yeah. I try to stick away from stuff like that. They'll come up on the points and get in that upper half or upper third. You know, trying to play the wind. But what I notice is a lot of these hubs. That's why I said people look at it on a micro level a little too much. Um, I'm looking at a big macro level on these hubs. Sometimes they're fairly sized, a couple hundred yards, actually, in these travel hubs. I can play with the wind and thermals all day in that, especially yeah. if you ditch or creek through it. You know, that's not a problem. Now, when you get that real tight when it's only 20 yards across, you're probably going to struggle a little bit down there. You yeah. want to work off the, work off of that then and kill them. But if I have a big hub system, I've got one that comes in mind, you know, it's probably a couple hundred yards each way. Well, there, uh, yeah, you may, you may in a situation get the wind may do something funky. You got to check it, you got to wind map it. But situation like that, I can typically use the terrain at to my advantage um, with my wind and thermals. Yeah, no, you're, yeah, you're, you're spot on with that. And like that was Ohio is where I learned my lesson that that is, yeah, does, isn't able Don't to apply. There. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I tried that the whole first year that I yeah, it looks that I great down there, there but. Oh, yeah. those scrapes are beautiful, and it was like beautiful. every one of them is like a perfect circle, and they're giant, and it's yeah. just like everything yeah, I want. You, I mean, you can kill them there. I know guys that kill them there, but you got to get lucky a little bit there. <laughs> yeah. You have to just time it just right, you know. Yeah, yeah. As that wind's just like gusting this way, the buck's got to be coming down at that yeah. exact time. <laughs> yeah, the good Lord's got to bring a hand in and help a little bit with those ones down there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, so I I had a question I just thought of here, and so this is something that 
uh all right so say you're say you're hunting in a, in a shooter buck say it's your number one buck you see him yep. but he's out of range and you don't have an opportunity do you do you still stay in that area because you believe he's going to be around or are you feeling like i need to, to readjust or what what's your thought process with that i, I mean there's a couple ways to look at it. if it's an existing area i have historical data with i feel i'm in the spot i'm going to sit him out in a situation like that, I have historical data. I'm pretty damn good in the kill tree I'm in. I'm going to put my time in and kill him. That's how I feel. Unless there's a hot doe comes through. Even if that hot doe doesn't have him on her. If I see a hot doe out 60 yards, either he's on her or he just comes through, I am moving immediately and getting on that trail. That situation there, I'm going to move. Um, now, if I was in a brand new area, I don't have a lot of ass time in it and that. If I see a big shooter out, say, 60, 70 yards, I don't know if I'd still move. It depends how confident I am. If I'm new to the area, maybe I'm missing something. Um, one buck coming through, he hits my shooter. I don't know if I'd move. I think I'd want to see something again to maybe I would. That's where the in-season scouting. Maybe that's where I get down midday. Maybe I'm missing something, and maybe I move. But typically in a rut, I honestly, only thing I move for and to be honest, even new areas typically is a hot doe. I've learned that over the years. If she comes through at 67 yards, there's probably other deer coming 67 yards down her trail. You're probably going to want to get in bow range. Yeah. No, no, that, that, that makes total sense. And like, but okay. So if say, I know you're, you're like me and we don't hunt, you know, we might be going after one buck, but we'll shoot other deer. But say yeah. that was yeah. your only buck that you wanted to shoot in that area and he goes yep. through do you think he's gone or do you think there's a chance that she he's brings him back, back to her? they're not that, i i just said everybody said they're here and gone um especially if you already got if he's your number one well you got history with him apparently you got pictures so he's yeah. in the area so you're in his core um can he get up and leave absolutely but from what i've seen a lot of times i've actually seen is i've seen some newer bucks move in around that 20th of october okay and they seem just to stick around for a week, two weeks. And I've killed a lot of bucks like that. I'll get like nighttime pictures, you know, in the teens and the twenties in October of a particular buck or two. And I'll just hunt that area. And eventually I'm going to kill him because he's going to daylight eventually in that area. It seems like they will come into a core area. Even the shooters you have, you know, knowledge with because there's usually more than one doe that's coming in heat in that family or two, you know, you know, if you're hunting one bedding area, um, you know, that's where maybe one, two, three does are going to cycle in maybe every couple of days. He's probably going to be in there for a little while, but that's where you get back to where if you can hunt multiple doe bedding areas, you're probably going to be in the, in the works for a couple of weeks, in my opinion, for one particular buck probably, probably. And the situation like, yeah, you're hunting multiple doe bedding areas, your shooter's in here, you've visually seen him, you've got some historical data on camera day or velvet or early October. Man, I'm telling you, if I seen him, I'm feeling pretty damn good where I'm at, and I'm going to stick it out. Maybe I have a plan, you know, another spot or two for rut in around that particular area. I may bounce around within a few hundred yards, but it's still going to be the same thing. I want to put a lot of time in that general area, though. Yeah, I'm I'm the I'm the same way with if if I'm going to move, it's going to be within a few hundred yards of that spot because you're there for a reason, and just because you went through. You know, now say it's a buck you have never seen in your entire life and he came through. Maybe he is just, and he's just cruising on his own on a loan. Maybe he's going to be two miles away in yeah. two hours. You, you don't know yeah. that. But yes. yeah. but when you're you have historical data with it or if there's like if there is a hot doe in the area, a lot of times they just run them in circles. I mean, yeah. I can't tell yeah. you how many times yeah. I've seen does just run bucks and they come back and yeah. go through. And I was like, I've been drawn back three different times and it's the same, yeah. you know. Yeah, that's situation. what you got to read. The, like I told you, I move when I see hot doe. Yeah. You got to read the situation too. Yeah. If they're doing the whole ping pong thing, well, you probably <laughs> want to stay. It could happen, you know, definitely. That's like the most fun, but the most frustrating oh, thing I, I, ever. Yeah. How many times we've all had it happen to a rut hunter? Yeah. Ping pong, you know, yeah. ping, like. There is nothing better. I'm going to get fired up here, okay? <laughs> the, the shit's coming in my head. There is nothing. You know it's going to be one hell of a freaking day when you get up that tree. Like, you're walking in and already seeing deer, okay? And you can smell it in the air oh, of the musk. Yeah, I was just going to say And you get smell. in that tree. You're not even in the tree, and you hear the, the shit snapping on the ridges. You hear the grunting. You're in it that day. And I will guarantee you, most of the time when I get in the tree before daylight and it shit's happening... I usually kill 
or I'm going to have fun that day. It is just the sense in the air, then bucks know it, and you pick the right tree for the day, man. That is rut hunting at its best. <laughs> oh, yes, 100%. And the, with the smell, when I smell yeah. yes, rotting bucks, bucks, like smell, I mean, and it, if it's a frosty morning, man, I'm telling you, I'm getting fired up. And I hope other people get fired up because you know what the hell we're talking about, you know? <laughs> that is, and people don't understand the rut is the most boring, effinous freaking time year a lot of times okay it is we're sitting all day it's freaking boring you see some scrubs you see some dough you don't see no shooters but you can hunt 20 days and you might get one day maybe two all freaking season of days like that and they're the magical days of rut and that's why i'm a freaking rut hunter yes it, yes exactly <laughs> and that's what makes all of that silence oh, worth it yeah like, man the way i look at the rut it's 99.9 percent .9 silence and then 0.1 percent <laughs> chaos like and the, the twig snaps you hear the twig you hear the grunt and you're just like oh baby <laughs> and when you hear like a just a real deep oh, oh yeah you just hear the man you hear that brush you hear the twig snap down the valley or something like oh you're like it's so funny you'd be sitting there you'll hear it you're like, oh, like, please, Lord, come up here. I want to see what it is. Like, please, you're like, come on, come on, come on, bring it here, bring it up here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's exactly right, too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I, I can picture so many scenarios of that. Oh, just God, like, man. I was like, oh, here we go, here yeah. we go. When we hunt clear cuts, you know, near clear cuts. You hear them bastards back in that cut, and you all you want to do is see what it is. Yeah, you just want to see. Like it's not necessarily kill the bastard. I want to see what he is. <laughs> you know, it's like that gets you fired up. You know, oh, uh, I, I've been in scenarios where that's happening. And it's just you know crashing. Yeah, I and then it stops. I, you know, I text my dad. I'm like, Dad, I was like. Big, big buck crashing through there. He's like, did you see him? I was like, no, but he's got to be. You know, it's like, <laughs> it sounds like a big buck. Yeah, you know, then finally those squirts out and there's a little year and a half six point behind her. No, yeah, or like last year is the season of one horn spikes. Like, oh, I was like, yeah. there had to have been three of them in this area just running. Oh, around. shit. Yeah, that's the that is the rut. <laughs> yes, yes, that is that is one hundred percent the the yeah. rut. And there, you know, and there's the 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 different phases of it as far as you know, like the pre rut, and yeah. then the kind of seeking phase, and then yeah. you got the chasing, and then you got you know, I, I, man, I, I someone just asked me the other day, like, do you know? when the lockdown time is and honestly i don't really have a lockdown time it's it's so different you know i'll give you i'll give you my opinion over the last couple of years of lockdown now we have the last few years pennsylvania used to end like the 10th 11th 12th you, you know and i remember pulling cameras and seeing box up running like at 13 14 like man we always said I remember me and my buddies but wish we could hunt one more week what should we hunt one week well now we can so we've been starting to be at ass time in a tree and start to visualize what's actually going along in the timber. This is my two cents with end of October through when we're done hunting, that third week of November. Um, what I see, we start to see it amp up. We mean you've talked about that mid-October, 13th, 14th. You can figure that scrape out. It's hard. Dynamite. You get them big bucks hitting daylight, middle of freaking the October lull, you know, so-called. You know, you'll see that. That's hard to hunt, but it happens. But as you get in the 20s, things start to get interesting, especially if the weather's there. That's your pre-rut. Man, scrape lines off bedding, in between bedding, off a of buck's bed, wherever it is. Man, dynamite hunting. That's probably arguably the best week, in my opinion, that last week of October. You get the weather, the big mature bucks are trying to find the first does, you know, a lot of them. What I think what happens is as we get through the last week of October into the first day or two of November, it's really good. What I've noticed, now I've killed bucks on the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, absolutely. But it almost seems like the big ones are locked down now within first dose. And first couple of days in November where it's November 3rd, 4th, like, it's the rut. It's like slow, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. for good buck action. And then that traditional 7th, 8th, ninth, you know, it seems that that's that little pocket of just, like we just talked about that chase and like that it just wolf that a lot of times has been around that seventh night time period for me um i've killed a lot of bucks on the seventh and night two great days that seems to be like the prime of the rut the chasing and, and you know you're in it 
And then it seems what happens is the lockdown. And I almost take the lockdown almost like I take the theory of the October law, if this makes sense. Um, what I know is, is it slower in the double digits of October, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th? You know, we get it to about the 19th or 20th. Absolutely. That rut tends to not be as intense. But what I'm noticing is the biggest bucks are up on their feet in that time period. They bred the first dough or two, okay? Now they're looking for that third, fourth, whatever dough. Are bucks locked down in that time period? A majority of them, absolutely, but they're not all locked down. So the bucks that are coming off those, and they're all coming off different, in that time frame, that lockdown, some are going to go look for does, and they have to look for does now because there's not as many, you know, as we progress into the double digits. Um, so what I'm looking, what I've noticed on my camera data and ass time, um, days that I drug out my tag in PA is I'm seeing the biggest maturest bucks up on their feet in those double digits of November, the so-called lockdown period. It is it as good as that seventh, ninth period, end of October? No, but I've seen some good action. But what I'm seeing is big, mature bucks, specifically midday, a lot of times moving probably in between those. I'm seeing, to me, the kill the biggest, baddest boy in the block, that double digits, our last week, say, of our archery, man, it's tough because none of us want to have a tag at that time period. Don't get me wrong. That's, I was just... but, but, man, I'm, that's when I'm seeing the big guys. Like my, I pull my cameras like, holy shit, it's November 14th, and there's 150-inch of daylight in that scrape, or I catch them chasing a doe or something. You know, Like I said, it's not as intense, but I'm almost like the lockdown is a thing, but I'm almost – I don't think has it's been portrayed in the magazines and on TV. I think if you're get uh, discouraged because it's locked down, you're missing out on some fantastic, at a fantastic opportunity to kill the biggest buck of your life. Personally, yeah, man, I I, I would agree with that. And and I it's the the way you just said, and I just thought about it actually earlier today. I was texting a guy that I'm looking to have come film with me for a few days. I'm trying to pick the days. Okay, I'm like, I was like, all right, I was like. Maybe like the 11th through the 14th of November. I'm like, I don't know if I still have a tag then, but it's like, man, I wish I could just like hold out for that time period because it's yeah. like that is when, yeah. you know, and actually, even if I look at, you know, behind West Virginia is a little bit different. That was the 16th of November. That's just a little bit of a later time frame, anyways. This buck over my shoulder here, that was November 11th. The one you can't see over here was November 10th. Um, my oldest deer was November 14th. Uh, nine and a half year old deer, like, that that is when I've killed my biggest deer is yep. in that you know that later time frame. It's just hard because we're killers. Not in the day, yeah. Like not to be blunt to, but at the end of the day, we like to kill deer. Like we want, yeah. Like you don't want to. We don't want to gun hunt. We're bow hunters. I'll buck gun hunt. Not against it, you know. But it's like the stress of that. It's like you know we all like to tag or tag a deer. You know, if you yeah. Want to a buck, you know, you know what it's like. You know, it's pretty. You know, I don't know about you, man. When it's Thanksgiving, I'm sitting there. I got a buck tag down. It, it, you know, from both season, I feel pretty good at Thanksgiving dinner. I got to worry about gun hunting the next day. You know, on Saturday yeah. or whatever. You know, I go shoot doe and have fun, and enjoy it. So yeah, that pressure's there. Like, but anymore, it's like, man, Moose, you got to eat that tag. You got to eat that tag because you're going to have to go through that last week if you want to probably kill one of the bigger bucks in the area, you know, because they get on them dough. They just, I mean, yes, it can happen. I've killed bucks third, fourth, fifth, whatever, but it just seems that big ones, man, they just get holed up with them damn does earlier part of the rut and they get a little car to kill. You know, like I said, you pick the right tree and doe walks by, and, you know, to worry about it, you know, or he is in between the doe, but. The big guys seem to be vulnerable as that. Like, you always hear, like, Kansas and that. Guys go out around Thanksgiving, you know. And I think it's the same thing. Now, we don't go quite that long, but uh, I know a guy last year killed a 180-incher. Yeah, it was in Mizwet State, but it was Thanksgiving week, you know. That yeah. deer was nowhere seen, nowhere saw, come into a farm, looking for them last couple of does and got killed. Yeah, you know, I just think later, that mid to late October, November, I mean, that's where the big guys are vulnerable. I really do. Yeah, because yeah, you, you said there's not as many out there for them to be able to yeah. to breed, and it's just yeah. like they they're getting a little bit desperate and having yeah. to get up. They're not, yep. you know, they're not the king on campus anymore. The does aren't coming to them. They don't have yeah. them all picked yeah. out. It's like yeah. they got they got to yes. start looking. Yeah, I don't know how many times like I've hunted the Midwest, Iowa, and stuff, and you know I I have been fortunate and killed you know around November first, second, third out there like in Iowa, but I remember days I've killed was seeing big freaking bucks just laying with a doe or two just like it's the rut 
You know what I mean? Just laying with that dough. He's got her. He ain't going nowhere. You yeah. know, and it just shows you, man, if they have it, they're not going to leave it. They're not, they're just going to move when she moves. That's what makes it tough. Yeah. I mean, that one I killed in West Virginia, that was, I mean, he was, now that's, you know, more open country there, but yeah. So I got to actually visualize it, but he, Still didn't, same. Yep. he had no idea. Even when I was yep. 30 yards from him and I blew out that dough, he had no idea there was trouble going on. He was just focused. Where's this dough going? Where's this yep. dough going? And just yep. like, she'd lay down and he'd, he'd lay down next to her and they'd do a circle kind of around yep. her and get her worked up and lay back mm-hmm. down. And he'd do that again, you know, an hour later. And it was just yep. like, to be able to visualize and see it where a lot of times we can't see that actually happening with, with it yeah. being so thick yep. woods and everything. But, um, yeah, no, I, I agree. It's, it's, I, I was just thinking about that. I'm like, man, like I, I truly believe that that second and the third week in November can be so incredible. It's just like, yeah. I, it's, I, it's just human nature for us. You know, I mean, there is a, a few select guys where the, you know, the killers out there, <laughs> you know, that can just, you know, hold that tag and don't care. But uh, we, you all have to be honest. We do care to a point. You know, I, even yeah. tell myself, I don't care if I kill them, but trust me, back end, you put all this work in. You do like the reward at the end, even though that's not what it's about. We love the process, but yeah. at the end of the day, it does feel pretty damn good. You know, like I said, when it's Thanksgiving dinner, you're sitting around, you got a buck tag pack punched from archery. <laughs> yeah. Like, and, and, and I have come to like, like I've enjoyed rifle hunting um, yeah, last year and stuff. Like, I do enjoy that to a, to a, a point but like i don't you know obviously i don't want everybody to have two tags in pa but it'd be nice like for me you know so i could go out <laughs> me i mean I, I love to shoot those does i love shooting dough and i yeah. love toting a rifle in the mountain shooting dough and i'm telling you ain't a, it, the best time i'd be honest with you i love killing a good buck i love bow hunting but man when that buck tag's punched and i'm in the mountains of rifle hunting dough i can break up the jet bull i can sit there all day and man that is just living yeah you know, just living you know no pressure <laughs> yeah and it's like uh I, I, someone had said to me they're like you know what how you, you say it's you know it's stressful or whatever like how is that that fun you're putting all this you know is it is it because the podcast because i was like no i i've always been this way my whole family yeah, I, been I, that I've way always, like I, yeah <laughs> and and like as much as you say that and it doesn't and and it's not fun sometimes but it that's part of what I love about it. And I don't, yeah, I can't I, even I, explain it. I tell myself, you know, in a day, like you, I said, Hey, we're on the, we're on this circle of, you know, this side with, with the, uh, you know, the, the industry and yeah. stuff, you know, so it does put pressure on you. And I've learned yeah. over the last couple of years that, you know, in a day I am a deer hunter and that's what I'm going to focus on moving forward. But me personally, and it's not really the outside influence. Last couple of years was the outside influences. You know, we get part of great organization stuff like that. So you, you almost feel like you're expected to perform, but then you learn to take a step back. It's about yourself. And me personally, I've always been a competitive, competitive person for myself. I put that pressure on myself. You know, I put this work in stuff like that. End of the day, yes, like you said, it is stressful, but we put that pressure on ourselves. But that is a part of it. And I think when we become, we are successful. Man, it makes it sweet. It, it, makes it does. It so you, sweet. You know. Man, we've all been there where we're having a tough go or whatever, and it's weird when it happens. We sit there. It's so weird when it happens. It's like you almost don't really – it doesn't feel real because you said you're busting your balls, you're busting your balls, and it's like it happens like that, and you're like, I'm done. Like like you went through <laughs> all that, stressed out, everything else, and you're done. It's just crazy how it happens, you know? You know, like that's one of my favorite things. So you, you shoot a deer and, you know – if you're either by yourself or say you had someone coming to help you, but you're just there by yourself and you're sitting yeah. over that deer yeah. and just reflecting on like all this stuff and how much yeah. time and everything has led to this moment right here. Like, and just, yeah. it's, it's a, it's, you, I would strongly urge that, that before you, you know, before you, you sit in there and you're taking pictures and you're doing all this stuff, just yeah. soak it in. I, I, I've learned that over the years. Um, that I, I, I do that a lot now, um, is uh, even like, you know, I sell film and stuff like that too, but it's almost like, I don't even want to walk up filming. I want to, okay, I'm going to stop the film short. I'm not going to give you that ending quite yet. Um, cause that's between me, the Lord and the appreciation for the white tail. Um, it's kind of how I look at it now to where, okay, we're going to stop for a sec, putting the phone and shit away. And then it just me and him. And the good Lord, I, I just want to take that and do it. I would just sit there. I like, I like even the buck I killed last year in PA, he wasn't the biggest buck, but I knew with my dad coming out and stuff, that story, 
was what it was about. The memories of that. It wasn't about the horns. It has nothing to do with that. Just that memory around, and I've learned to soak that in, man, is, man, we work so freaking hard for this to get to that climax. And when I get there, man, because like I said, you think about it, it's only a couple seconds it happens. We do this for hundreds of hours, hundreds of miles all year. Maybe you go a couple years without killing. What has, man, man, yeah, step back, put the phone away, sit back, and just enjoy it. Either drink a cup of coffee, smoke a cigar. I don't care how you celebrate. Just sit there and enjoy it for a while before you start figuring, you know, taking care of business. Yeah, and and like in those moments, like I don't even care if it's – you know, closing in on dark or it's like, I don't care yep. at that point how yep. long it takes yep. me to get out of there. What yep. it, it's just like, it's, it's yep. so I, I remember there was in uh, 2017, November 8th, I shot a buck and I shot him at noon, right at noon. And I found him not long after that. And this deer was a awesome, a body. I just couldn't wait to show everybody at, at camp. Um, but you know, I hung out there for a little while with it and I was like, I'm going to drag them out. I'm going to take the whole body yep. out versus cutting them up. And, and everyone else was hunting, but you know, they were like, Hey, you need any help? We'll get out of the tree. I'm like, no, like I, I got all, I got yeah. nothing but time. Like I'll just yeah. take my time. Yeah. Now I damn near killed myself trying to get it in the bed of my truck, <laughs> but I used some ratchet straps and a whole bunch of other stuff to help me get it in there. Yeah. But it was like, that's I, what I rem- that's, yeah, I yeah, enjoyed the hell out of that. Yeah. That's what I said last year, you know, um, you know, uh, my dad is my best friend and I know how reality of life works. You know what I mean? My dad's getting older. And I shot that buck and it was by far not the biggest buck I've shot and probably something I should have passed, but I didn't give an F at the moment. You know what I mean? Because the realization of my dad being at the end of that logger of the cart, you know, I remember, man, I, dude, I broke down a bald walking out. You know what I mean? And I've never done it before because reality starts to set into where man it has nothing to do with them horns, man. You know, like that moment there was my dad. You know, one of these days he's not going to be at the end of the logging road. You know, it's it's a fact of life to reality. And things like that, older I get, you know, I'm going to be pushing 50 here. And it, I think reality as you get older is, you know, the people that are in your life and stuff like that, man, it's going to be the members. You're going to remember everything. And when I get that opportunity to, you know, etch that in my mind, um, I'm going to take it for advantage of it for sure. Yeah, no, that's, uh, you, you're, yeah, spot on with that. And like, I, that, the one thing that I, really enjoyed doing too is like um you know i talked about that one where everybody was uh so a tag in their pocket but like when like that november the one november 4th in 2022 um i had no service down there but i had my in reach so i was able to send a text out yeah. and i was like you know it was right before dark anyways but i was like hey uh i i texted my dad and i was like my brother was home at the time. He wasn't living in PA. He was in Montana, but he was home visiting to spend yeah. time at deer camp. And he was like, and I was like, Hey, I want, you know, you guys, after you're done hunting, I said, don't get out of the tree early. I was like, which they didn't have much time anyways, but I was like, do whatever you need to do. I'll be sitting here. I'll be, uh, I'll just walk back up to the truck and, you know, meet you guys there yeah. and, and come in and, you know, Kurt and Mason and my dad and like, Having them all, you know, at first, the first yeah. thing they say is because when I was younger, I'm, they'll never let me live it down is when I'd be like, I'd send a BBD text before I knew <laughs> that it was actually down and I'd, you know, I'd want to just completely missed and I thought <laughs> I made a good shot. So like, they still joke with me. Yeah, Mason's still, like, still getting your balls busted for that one. Yeah. Mason's like, so, uh, you know, did you, did you see him? Like, is he, is he you sure? Are you sure? I'm like, yeah, I'm sure on this one. Like, I'm, I'm like, I, I touched him. Like I'd walk, I saw, I, I heard him fall. Like, you know, I walked up to him. I, I made sure twice. Uh, I took a picture just to, you know, I'm not gonna show you the picture, but I took a picture just to make sure he doesn't get up and go. And, yeah. uh, but like those moments are just, oh, yeah. are so yeah. awesome to, to yeah. be able to have with everybody. Yeah, man. I'm telling you, hell, we got way off the November rush shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's, that's fine. Like, I, that's, that's good, man. Everybody, I'm sure people, people get it. People get that's, it. That's that's all. That's all. Yeah. yeah. That's all part of it. Like, I mean, and this is like we're talking about the rut. This is the rut for me. That, yeah. Like I said, that this is the, that all this is that's when I've killed majority of my deer and these memories. Um, be honest, a lot is just around that time period, man. I just and if it is coming up here, man, it just it gives you chills. And uh, like I said, we're recording back. You know, we're recording here in August, but uh, you know, we got a couple cool mornings last week in the forties. It's like, whoo. Man, you just smell in the air. You can feel it. You just start to visualize those mornings, you know, being in that tree. Oh, yeah. And so I do I do want to ask you a little bit about last season. So, yeah. 
yeah, you had killed that buck in Pennsylvania, and you had yep. also went to Iowa, right? Yes, sir. Yep. Um, so let's hear about the the Pennsylvania season. Like, when was that? Kind of how how? Tell me how it all went down. Uh, that buck year, um, actually, like I said, we uh, we we both preached that like that three year rule into a new area. Um, this particular area, I was uh, in for a couple years, but this spot was actually found um, the postseason leading up to last year. Um, got in there and I was like, man, it just looked good. Spotty sense is going off. And it usually it takes a little while to still fine tune them spots. Um, but just happened to be one of them spots, man, how it set up. Uh, it was a big scrape line running across the ridge system, um, connecting bedding areas. It was actually a bedding area and some primary food source on some private. And I went in there. Uh, I was the 24th, I believe, went in there. Uh, set up wrong, got busted by some does. And, but I knew it was one of them spots I needed to go back in again. Um, uh, went back in on 25th and I can't remember, recall it was like 9 30 more. I can't recall. Um, he come through working straight line that killed him. Um, just like I said, doesn't always happen at that first time. Like I really, for a rut wise, sometimes I have to fine tune that over a year or two, um, between camera intel and scouting more and stuff like that last time. Um, but this instance here, it just worked. You know, I kind of made a micro adjustment for the second day. Um, what's great about being mobile and I ended up killing. Okay. And how, how much of an adjustment did you have to make? Uh, it was probably literally 10 feet. It basically was a okay. cover That's thing. A, yeah. I was then those like, come here, like, oh, look at this idiot. <laughs> he does like, <laughs> oh, and, like, it was one of those, you get up in there and the big straight trees. And I was like, you know, like, yeah, I'm only like, you know, 14 feet on the ground. I'm not real high, you know? Yeah. And I'm thinking, man, I kind of felt naked up there. And them does, yep, you look naked up there. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. like, <laughs> sun's glaring on you. I'm going to face paint or nothing on, you know? It's like, I'm standing out like a beacon, you know? It's like, yeah, I probably should go over that tree over there and get on the backside. And that's what I did. And I'm killing that buck. You know, oh, he yeah. had no clue coming through that morning. Yeah. I, yeah. Isn't it, isn't it so funny of like that, those micro adjustments that you, yeah. you find, yeah. like you get in there. I, I do that quite a bit too. That, that is what we call mobile hunting, boys and girls. Mobile hunting is not how many times I can move in a day or a year. Mobile hunting is fine-tuning an area so you can kill or reading the sign to kill. It's not how many times I can kill. That's what, pe what people don't understand about mobile hunting. Mobile hunting is there so to put you in the right tree at the right moment, not how many places I can move around and I'm being mobile. Yeah, yes, yes. That That is the best explanation I've yes. heard of that and that's <laughs> oh, cuz like and, and the, so that's like you know lightweight you know whether it's stand or saddle yeah. or whatever it is that is where that benefit that huge benefit is versus when I used to hang a bunch of presets and I, I still think presets can be good especially when you have an area fine tuned but yes. when I'd I'd yeah. I'd carry in these heavy steel sticks that you know that the guide gear ones you get yeah. forty dollars for the pack of them you stick them together they're heavy I put a big heavy steel platform up because I wanted to have as many as I could so it was super cheap yeah. on what I was buying yeah, and yeah. but they were such a bitch to, to move and, and like, yeah. oh, I mean, there was, it was borderline dangerous trying to hang those things sometimes by yourself <laughs> yeah. and, and you're doing that and, and, and you got ratchet straps and everything on them that were loud. And so you didn't want to, you didn't want to make that you were there. You're like, well, this is what yeah. I am have to deal with. <laughs> yep. to deal. Yep. Yep. Uh, so that's, that. Yeah, that's exactly how I would describe mobile hunting. And, and, yes. and, and that's yes. what I talked about a lot when I did that, um, kind of seminar thing at the mobile hunter expo was was yeah. that it was like we're here for mobile hunting look for the lightest weight you know this kind of gear whatever's going on it's like that's all fine and dandy but this doesn't this doesn't mean that you should just float from tree to tree and area to yeah. area all the time it's specifically in a rut in the, it's one thing you're reading sign in the early season or something like that or late season trying to find a food store primary food source or something but uh you know in the rut like i said you should have done your homework already so you should know kind of if you're posting scouting where you should be. And like I said, that's where you just you just need to fine tune. You know what I mean? And what other nice thing about mobile too, like I said, it's not how many times you can move, it's about adjusting the you know, the area you're in is I tell guys too, remember you're mobile. You have the prime spot. You got your rut spot. Say so you man, this this is it, man. This is it. And you and you need a west wind to hunt it that day. Well, the next day it's gonna come out of the south. Remember you're mobile, you can manipulate the spot. You may not be in hundred percent. You may not be right in the center where you need to be, where 100% of that action is going to be. Maybe you got to move 30, 40 yards. Just where mobile comes in handy, manipulate the spot to use that wind or thermals. Where I'm not in 100%, but I'm in 7% now. I like my odds. Yeah, yeah, and that's where 
yep. when the, the, I mean, I'm sure you get it because you, you talk about the same things, but like the, the question of like, oh, you say you're going to sit in an area for three or five days. What happens if the wind shifts? It's exactly what you just said. It's manipulating yep. that spot. Yep, that's and, mobile. Like I said, that is mobile hunting. That, that's, that's where it shines right there. You're not stuck in a preset. Um, what a preset will teach you, what a preset will teach you as you grow up and go through the rut is you learn to hunt a spot because you only have so many stands, so many presets. You learn to hunt a, cut, a spot a couple times in a row. Well, that's where you learn that multiple day rule. But you get screwed because you're probably watching a lot instead of killing, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just micro adjust, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah, exactly. And w- like when with your setups, what are you trying? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to have as much going on? You talked about like, say, you know, connecting those doe bedding areas, but that exact spot that you're hunting now, a lot of them look differently, but if you were to, yeah. to, to tell me what a perfect scenario looks like, are you looking, you know, for in the rut, like you know, a scrape that's there, or are you looking for a bunch of trails that are crossing? Are you looking for the terrain that funnels through like, are, and how, how you just explain to me, like maybe some of your past spots that you feel good about. If you're going to get my perfect spot, like I said, first thing there's going to be multiple doe bedding areas. Hands down, multiple dotings, three, four, five dotings. And I would like to situate myself in between there somehow where my access, you know, exit entry is clean. But the spot itself, typically what I notice is, A, as a rut hunter, terrain is key to funnel it into bow range. What I like to find in a spot is that diversity of habitat and terrain, where both of those edges, those terrain features and edges of the habitat come into a central location where I can cover it in bow range, if that makes sense. It is the spoke of the wheel, and I am in the center of it. The center of that is either some form of a terrain feature or habitat feature, or preferably both the diversity, where it forces that buck to come through a particular area within bow range that I can kill him. I can set up that spot, and I can I can get aggressive that spot also. I can hunt that spot multiple times with an access that's clean. If the wind's off a little bit one day, okay, I might give up 20% today, but I still have 80%. It moves a little bit next day. I still, I'm like, it's that whole 70, 30, 80, 20 thing. I'm still in there. They can come from anywhere. I might have to get up and I get busted sometimes. Don't get me wrong. But majority of time in situations, um, you know, it is aggressive sometimes in those areas too because of the wind and thermals. But like I think you have to, if they feel comfortable coming into an area, you're you they, they have to think they're safe, the mature bucks. I think to a point. The rut they do tend to let their guard down, but they're still pre- kind of smart. So an area like that, if I if he thinks he's coming in an area and he thinks he's safe, but he's not, that's a perfect scenario for me. You know? Um what else I noticed too is I tell guys, I've said this before, is the area, like I said, diversity is key with habitat terrain. The other thing I like, it's almost like fishing, like bass fishing with structure. I like blowdowns. I like green briars. I like shit in there, man. Like, it seems like mature buck comes from the area. I don't want to be in open woods. I typically, it, very rarely you're going to see me in a situation that's really open. But, man, you get in there, some blowdowns, some structure. Man, I love that stuff. I just feel like when bucks come through an area and there's almost like there's something there that protects them or if that makes sense, cover or something. They could dive into some or get out of uh, way of something. I like structure. Almost like I said, bass fishing where guys fish for bass and structure. Man, if you get an area where that diversity is there, that structure there, and then you have the doe bedding, you have some type of terrain and habitat, man, I mean, it's hard to find them. It's hard that everything comes together in one spot. Do I find them? Yes. And like I said, that's why they're my prime areas. Yeah. Yeah. And it is, it is so hard to find those areas, but when you find them, everything lights yeah. up and it makes it work. Yeah. Like to me, it's like, there's, there's a lot of times I'm trying to force spots to be good because I'm not yeah. finding what I'm looking for, Yeah, but I've learned yeah. that just you just got to keep going at that point and keep going until yeah. you find those, yeah, those really rare. good spots. And, and like I tell my, uh, my thing is I want multiple things coming to one location because I want multiple opportunities. Like I said, when you hunt like that, you're probably going to flirt with the devil a little bit. If there's multiple things coming to the uh, certain locations, well, the wind's coming out of, or thermals are doing one thing. So they're probably going to disrupt one of those travel routes. I don't care in that situation like that a lot of times. Um, cause I'd rather give up 20% that I'm 80% in the game. 
Now that 80%, I got to feel confident. I don't want to give up a part that the, the part that I feel that's dynamite. You know, you're hunting like a, a location, like a creek crossing. Well, you don't want your thermals and wind dumped to the creek crossing. Yeah. Yeah. That's or blowing a, yeah. into one of the dough. But like I said, there, that's where your common sense has to come in. Your woods should have to come in. But you know, okay, I'm going to lose this side trail a little bit, but man, yeah, it could happen. It does happen, but the odds are still in your favor. And I think a lot is just stacking the odds in your favor. Yeah, and that's that's where I always like if I'm on like a side hill situation when it comes down to, you know, we've talked about this a lot at scouting camp, but yeah. you know, the above or the below the trail as far as like all right, there's a bench system that might be 30, 40 yards wide, whatever it might be, maybe a little bigger. You know, do you sit up above it or do you sit down below it? And it's like a lot of times it's going to depend on when I'm going to plan on sitting that spot. If I'm thinking yep. that this is a spot that's cruising kind of mid morning into the day, well, yeah. the thermals are probably coming up that point. I may want to be above the trail, but if this is yeah. like, okay, this is a spot where either historical data or something showed me maybe later in the evening or first thing in the morning, well, I'm going to want to sit down below it. Yeah. And I'm not, and I'm not, I don't know. I just, I've heard guys that do it, but I'm not a person that's, I'm not going to climb down and climb up a, a different tree as soon as these thermal switch and do all this crap. I don't do it either. No, like, I don't do it. it like, tr- what is, this is just me and my, how I hunt. Like, guys, like, do you hunt benches? Do you hunt that? Yeah, but this is how I like to do it. That bench is full of scrapes, okay? Full of scrapes. That's a singular thing, in my opinion. I told you, I'm looking for multiple. What I'll do is I'll work that bench out. I mean, it's hot, and you can kill bucks there, absolutely. What I'll do is I'll work that bench off to where a draw is coming up, you know, work that bench out to draw. Okay. Now I got multiple forms of travel in this. In, like I'd rather go there. Now I can use that draw or a ditch or something like that for my thermals, for my wind, for my access. Now I got more things in favor. Now that's kind of how I like to play it. This looks great, but can I do better? Oh, they, I, and I might lose a sign. This is where you got to work off the sign. People's like, Oh, hot side. Look at all these scrapes. I got to hunt right here. Well, if you went 75 yards down here, there was a heavy draw coming up. There was multiple trails crossing the top of it. And there was a big heavy trail coming to the bottom. I could just work off the backside of that ridge system with my wind and thermals. I've got, instead of one, I got three things. But there's no rubs or scrapes there. Just some trails crossing top of that draw. But now, instead of one opportunity, I got three opportunities. He's going to come through there. But if he comes the other two, I still kill him instead of just focusing on that one thing. That's how my mind works when I'm trying to find a spot, the spot, is I'm trying to take what's great. Can I make it better? And I'm not worried about the sign. You got to, that's where you got to, that's something I've learned from Nathan Killen, one of the arguably best white to hunters in the country, is this looks fantastic, big scrape, big rubs, but let's work off of that to that funnel, that pinch where I'm going to kill him. Yes. And, and, and I feel like in the big woods, in the mountains, you have to, you almost have to do that. I never really say have yes. to, but like you kind of do in a lot of those scenarios because, yeah. you know, I, I'll think of, I'll, I'll give you an idea, uh, an example this spring. I, I brought Mason into an area with me and I was looking for this deer and I'd never been in this particular spot before I was just kind of branching out from it and we'd found a, a big scrape and I actually found a shed laying next to the scrape that was down in this kind of bottom of this draw kind of a, a hub but it's more like a bowl and then we worked our way up and we started heading towards this bench and all of a sudden there was a big rock and then a steep drop off and it just pinched really tight there but there, there wasn't really sign there were some trails but it wasn't really much sign that we worked out on the point and there was dough bedding everywhere yep. and it was some blow yep. downs and then down the bottom there was a big hub scrape on the other valley and like and then as you went up that next draw there was another spot where the blow downs pinched to terrain and it was yep. like a 20 yard spot so now yep. like when i look at that all right so i yep. found these these big ass scrapes i found all this sign the two spots that jumped out to me and Mason agreed and said the same exact thing were the, the two spots that really didn't have that sign, but that pinch between the rocks that went yep. up to that bench. And then that on the side of that draw where it met the blowdowns going yeah. up there because yeah. there's dough bedding on both of those points and that draw and there's sign around it. It's like, these are the connectors in between those spots where say yeah. for example where that scrape was at it was kind of a wide bottom and there were so many places that that deer could go yeah. um that i don't know if i could I, i'd probably see them but i don't know if i'd get them in bow range and yeah, it's that's like what I think, yeah you know that's where, like i said i think that's the importance i think that's where postseason scouting for the rut trumps in season scouting during the rut like you go in season yeah that bench absolutely you can hunt that bench if it's hot got big scrapes you're gonna be in season scouting go in there hunt and kill absolutely 
But now I'm going to go in her postseason scout, and that's where you find that secondary. That's where you find the kill tree. You know, that's why I love postseason scouting for the rut, because that's where you can really piece this all together and find the kill tree. Yeah, and like I, I was even saying, I was, I said if I go into this area, and I haven't checked the cameras yet, but if I go in there and I have this deer on there. Well, there's there's a chance I hunt them this year, but even then, and and people might think I'm crazy because deer is huge, but it's like I, I I still don't know enough yet. Like I I felt like yeah. I didn't have enough time in there. I I may I may throw some sits at those spot I was talking about, but I've got these other places that I've been building on on years. Like I have one spot yeah. that last year was just like there it was incredible, and I'm like and does are bedded near there. There's another spot with doe bedding travel through there. I know that's a dynamite spot. And for me, which you and I have similar goals in this, we want a yep. good buck and we want a yep. good experience. And I, I get off on that just as much. Yep. You know? Yep. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. So what, so like when you went, say when you went to Iowa, so Iowa is yep. not, I mean, I know you've hunted Iowa before, but, uh, it's not something that you're hunting every year. So how, how did you go into that trip? Was it, how is that different for you? This is, like I said, you have to take different uh, tactics in different areas and for different times of year. Um, this is what you don't do. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you don't do, boys and girls, when you go into – now, we're run hunting. I went in there October 30, 31st when I got there. I never stepped foot on that property. When a boot hit the ground that first day there, the first 10 seconds I got there, I made the biggest mistake of the trip – and the biggest reason why I ate my Iowa tag after 10 days of hunting. What I should have did was left the bow and the tree stand in my truck. Now, you can carry bows. You know how it is, right? Whatever your choice is. Me, personally, I don't like to carry anything. I like because then I'm hunting. I'd rather just put everything in the truck than I can just mentally wise focus on what I need to. I should have walked the perimeter of that. That It was a 550 acre. Now, I was hunting a farm, private farm. Okay, but You can do this private. I don't give a shit what it is, um, depending on the acreage. Um, what I should have did is I stepped out of the truck, left everything in, middle of the day, and walked that perimeter, okay, so I could read what was happening coming in and out of that property, okay. Then I move into the middle of and I blow that son of a bitch up, because you are not, you are not bumping a buck out of his core area. You're just not going to do it. I'm sorry. I don't believe it. I go in and I blow it up. So now I understand what I'm finding in the middle of that core area of that property i can connect that from what's coming into that property this is farm country okay yep um I can apply in the mountains too you know but i know what's going on now so that first day two days i should just scout it blue farm up as a run hunter and this was a hard farm to hunt because 80 percent was cedars so it was limited on the timber but i could have went in there blew that farm up found three or four of the best funnels on that farm okay so i'm on a 10-day hunt okay i wasted two days okay but day three and four i'd have been in it I'd have been it. Instead of hunting, going in there, not knowing, other than reading a map, I have no clue where I'm going. I'm just kind of walking slowly. There are tons of deer on the problem. There's deer sign everywhere. So you're like, where the hell do I even go? You're just trying to keep, I'm just trying to keep the wind in my face as I'm walking through there. And you're pussyfooting around for a day or two days, two, three, four days. Well, before you're, you're three, four days into hunt and you're still trying to figure the farm out. You know, you're doing slow instead of being aggressive which you should be, I'm just kind of just moseying through there. And before you know, the hunt's halfway over. Well, once that starts to happen, this is where the mental game starts to play in. You start to get frustrated. And I don't give a shit how good you are, how good you think you are. We're all human. In this situation here, I take a lot of pride being mentally tough. You know what I mean? And I grind it out and, you know, I don't let things bother me. I'll be the first one to tell you, this hunt here got to me. It's Iowa. I've been to Iowa three times, and typically two, three days, I'm done in Iowa. To be honest, not to be a cocky asshole, but the last couple of years, I've gone in and killed big bucks. And I'm thinking, it's Iowa. I'm going to do the same damn thing. Well, no. Brand new property, no no, no intel, no nothing. Um, I was walking backwards, you know, this whole trip. And before you know it, you start, it just starts snowballing, the mental part of it. And what was weird about it was day four or five. I knew it just wasn't going right. I did leave the bow in the truck. I left the stand in the truck. It was, uh, I did a morning hunt, and I said, this is just not working. Looked the map. There was some timber on the northern part of the property. I said, I've got to change something. Went in there, left everything in. Man, I got in the sign. It was just tore up. Found an overlooked ditch crossing it was a, or a ditch come up. I could play it with my thermals and wind. It was connecting another draw. I could kind of put everything together in my head for a funnel. 
I went in there, I went in there, hung my set, you know, I'm going to hunt. Um, had about, hey, probably been guessing 130 class deer. I'll be honest, I should have shot it. I had an opportunity at him. It was one of those, I should have shot that deer, and then he was coming in. I actually snort wheezed at him, brought him back in, and I was going to kill him, to be honest with you, but he just wouldn't give me a shot. So like, all right, all right. So I left the stand there. Next day, the biggest buck of the trip I had for 40 minutes, I played cat and mouse. He was on a doe, and I was just stupid and drew at the wrong time, and he busted me. But that shot opportunity, that 150, biggest buck I, had on, I seen on the trip and had an opportunity at 15 yards was because I got aggressive, I went scouting, left the bow in the truck, and figured it out, and I got on deer. But by that time, once that deer blew, the, the, more frustration kicks in. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then day 10, I ended up hitting a buck um, and ended up losing them. Um, you have hunts that are bad. Um, how I look at it, failure is the best number one teacher. And I will tell you this, rut hunt or whatever, um, I will not make that mistake ever again. I'd rather go home being aggressive with a tag than sitting back not being aggressive. If you're aggressive, I think in this game, you're going to kill a lot of whitetails. Yeah, and and man, no, I I think I think those types of trips. So for anybody, you know, someone like you, it's been to Iowa, it's been successful. You've done this before, yeah. But sometimes you just need that reminder as much. Yes, as you need to be humble. I, 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 I get humbled every year well, in some like, way I'll or be another. First one to tell you, man, I've killed some good bucks. Don't get me wrong. The Lord has blessed me. He has blessed me. He's opened up some doors. But I'm human. You know, I'm going to Iowa. I'm pounding my chest. I'm somebody, you know, you ain't nobody. <laughs> <mother effort. laughs> yeah. And white tells you're humbled. Mother effort is what the hell you are. And that's exactly what it is. And I think I was, I told guys it's crazy. That's probably the best thing that's ever happened to me in my hunting career, where the hell you want to call this? Because I took a step back and, it, and you think you're good. You're never going to be good enough to consistently kill white tails on everyday basis. None of us are even the great Andy Mays and, and the, the Quistos and all the greats out there. They don't kill every day. They go out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because we're never going to master this. We never will. And you have to understand that. You have to be humbled with this. Yeah. I, I This year, I'm going to a completely new place in West Virginia. I'm going down this weekend, actually, to check it out for the first time. But it's like, I'm like, man, like all it's all, it's all timber this time yeah. so it's all timber which you yeah. know i i have an idea of that but it's not there's no cuts there's no it's just big woods you know and yeah. steep mountains and i'm like all right yep. this is gonna be tough to figure out yeah. in, the, in the summertime and going into the fall but my plan is just go down get some cameras out and some funnel areas that i found on that i've located on the map and then whenever i go back down whether it's november or i don't i don't even know what i'm gonna go down but whenever i go down I'm going to spend a few days of just scouting before hunting because yes, yes. otherwise I've done this before. I, I learned it from when I first started going to Ohio 10 uh, over 10 years ago, whatever it was. It was like, I remember going in and setting up over the first hot sign that I saw. And like I said, started in the bottoms and then I found, yeah. you know, big scrapes yep. in the saddles and whatever else. And like, I just like almost forgot everything that I knew. And I was just like, <laughs> do it. Do, and I was like, Okay, yes. and then then once I started, yeah. um, two was it two years in or second year in, I started scouting and I, I started going there and scouting. I, I carry my bow with me because I I just like yeah doing yeah. That. But I yeah. get where I get what you're talking about. Yeah, with yeah. The, I, the in mental. Order to take it, me personally, I like to leave my stuff in the truck. That just me. yeah. I know I probably I'm, eventually it's going to burn me, but I'm okay with that. And and so like uh, but i went in and it's like the last three times i've hunted the rut in ohio i've killed in the first three hours of being there and it was yeah. like you, you know or the, the first like three hours i'm sitting and and yeah. going to hunt and it's like you know i went in i found the stuff i needed to and and i, I felt really confident about yeah. it where and it, it can it can throw you off your game say if you're used to just hunting one place or whatever and you go somewhere else yeah. it's a it's a different it's a different world and takes a little bit yeah. of a different side we're like yeah. say you in pennsylvania uh it's it's different where you don't necessarily need to go walking through all these these areas and doing that in the rut to find your spots because you've already done that homework yeah you have the historical that. data that, you have important. You said yeah. it right there the homework you know that that's what's important it's funny because uh, going on that trip i i hit a buck I tracked him a pretty good ways. I wouldn't be honest with you. I, I went too early on him. I didn't realize what I did wrong. But anyway, I'm walking around for that buck and these cedars. And I come up on this ditch crossing. And I'm telling him the good Lord shined on it. And I'm like, really? Really? Now I find this? <laughs> I mean, this <laughs> ditch crossing was amazing. There was a barbed wire fence, an old farm fence that was down. 
that went, it was down literally at this ditch crossing. It's like, there is rubs the size of my thighs, historical sign, new rubs, scrapes. It smelled like musk. I'm thinking, you God, if I'd walked around, I'd have found the son of a bitch. Like, <laughs> it's funny because this past week and I was at an event, another gentleman was hunting this farm. I showed him that pin where that, and I told him, I said, you will kill every deer on this northern piece of this property. If you got the right conditions, you hunt this, you will kill whatever's cruising on the north part of this property. Like, it just was like yeah. the, the most, I was just like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it didn't sting. It stung a lot more on driving home from iowa let me tell you <laughs> yeah it's not like you can just go back the next year yeah exactly <laughs> exactly yeah yeah it is but like i said i i think we all need humbled to to yeah. remember our place in this world and uh when it comes to whitetail um we think we know what we're talking about and then for some reason we get out there man we suck <laughs> yeah seems to be, you know because then whitetails like they're going to do this like i said always and ever man those two words do not exist in this world whitetails no, yeah, all, yeah, always and never, and and like I, I feel like you know, say when you and I talk about these things, and we talk about a lot of stuff in confidence, and it's based off of you know experiences that yeah. has, has been had with it. But that is not a that's not a, ever a hundred percent thing. Otherwise, yeah. we'd fill our tag the first time we're yeah, going. Like out. you said, the greats and the greats don't kill one every day. You know, and that just goes to show you it's, you know, they're, they're more consistent. Don't get me wrong, but yeah, get to that consistency. It, it takes years of being humbled. Yeah, no. And, 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 you know, I even seen it last year with my dad, like that was, so, the, that was the first year that he ate his tag since he was a kid. Like it was your dad. I've been around your dad a couple of camps and, and, you know, I told people this before your dad's probably one of the best bow hunters I've ever met deer hunters. I've met that's under the radar. You don't know about outside of your podcast. And, uh, he's a phenomenal hunter. And that just goes to show you there a guy that puts all that time and all that knowledge for decades can have a bad year, you know? Yeah. And even saw him get like, flustered with yes. you know things and yeah. just like yeah we're new you know like people think oh we're just robot we go up there oh we just hunt dark to dark and this we don't trust me, man that mine f <laughs> just, yeah well you got confident was, and confident kills don't get me wrong but seven eight nine ten days you know just going on and on dark to dark you know the weather's wrong something happens it, it's it comes a shit show sometimes you do have to be confident hold it together that's what's going to separate a lot of your killers from your guys who are getting frustrated when the moment does come um but Trust me, we, the mental F is there with all of us, you know? Yeah. And, and that's where, uh, and I've talked about on the podcast here quite a bit recently, but like my goal coming into it, hopefully everything goes good by the time this comes out out West. But I was like, <laughs> I've been, I've been focused so much more on different practice shot opportunities yeah. in my yard and tree and different things on the ground, like all these things, because that's where I had been failing recently. It was like, I'm getting yeah. the opportunity. So I'm doing my homework right there. Yeah. It's like, not finishing. how, yeah, not finishing on, yeah. on some of these. And it's like, and, and, you know, but at least it gives you a focus to work on. But one thing, like when the ball starts rolling downhill, it starts going downhill hard. A lot of times, like, you know, when it rains, it pours my, my dad's yeah. situation last year, where I remember, he was hunting this one deer and he was hunting hard and he got in there and he was sitting there and he's like, I looked and he's like this one spot. He's like, I feel like a buck's going to come there and I need to get my, my saddle platform just a foot higher so I can shoot over that branch. And as he yeah. was down on a stick, adjusting it, that's when that buck came in and he's just uh, like, you got to yeah, be kidding me. There are years like that, man. I got my <laughs> Iowa trip. Like that, like you just have hunts, you just have bad hunts or bad years, man. Shit just goes to shit and we're all going to experience it, you know? And like yeah. I said, the failure make you a better person. You got to learn from it, you know, that's all. But yeah, I mean, that's white to hunting, man. It's just, that's what it is, yeah. you know? No, for sure, man. And, and well, Moose, I'll let you get rolling here. It's, it's getting late. I know you've been running on some low sleep, so I, I, I appreciate you taking no the problem. time man, i here. love talking you know me man i mean anytime for you brother but uh when it comes to these white tails man i love talking about white tails <laughs> <laughs> yeah man i uh same and i i love i love talking to guys like you that are that are high energy that are motivated yeah. that put in the work it just makes me want to be better and go out and do it and like that's uh, that's awesome and i i think that's why you know when people love listening to you on the pod on the podcast and and whatever else it's like because you can hear it in your voice you can see it in your emotions <laughs> as far as like this eats you up yeah i love it man and i tell, tell everybody out there you know is this this is going to be 
you know, released probably back in October, I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, and, you know, hunt your own hunt and enjoy it. Um, because before you know it, man, it's another year. We're going to be out there postseason scouting. Summertime's going to be here again, sweating our nuts, putting cameras out. Man, it's here right now. Enjoy it. Hunt your own hunt. Don't get on social media. Worry about other people are killing. Just enjoy your hunt. Hunt your own hunt. What you're happy with, you tag it and you enjoy it. Don't worry about anything else. 100%. Couldn't. And I feel like this is, this will be at a really pertinent time for people yep. hearing that message too, as far as yes. just because people are going to start killing already and it's oh, going to yeah. be like, oh, yeah. you're going to feel like you're, it, in, you I suck. Hope you're yeah. one, I'm one, yeah. you know? But... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like them early kills. <laughs> yeah. Oh, me too. Uh, no, but Moose, no, I, I really appreciate you coming on. And anybody that's, uh, listen, recommend that you, if you have Instagram, follow Moose over there, Moose1720. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. So I know, I know, know your handle there. I watch all his, his stories are great. Getting to kind of see the, the behind the scenes and the scouting and the hunting. Real and raw. You broke, Real and raw. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I felt that I was right there with you in Iowa last year when you were posting those yeah. updates going through yeah. it and, and I was going through a rough mental state at the same time. So it's, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's what's nice about this stuff. You keep it real and raw. Other people can see that kind of feed off that we can feed off each other. <laughs> yeah. Oh, a hundred percent, man. But no, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank Ryan. you, sir. Yep. Thank thanks. You. Hey guys. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, share it with your buddies, leave us a rating, a review and subscribe. If you want to check out more content like this, there's plenty in the links below. We truly appreciate having you guys along with us.